Hi there, welcome to the Non-Serbian Podcast. I'm Lucy Steigerwald, and I have a, a pretty cool guest today that I was excited about. Um, we've, we've waited a long time for her, and that's our fault, not hers. We should be able to <laughs> um, Maryam Kava. And uh, I first knew about her from her Twitter account pri- at Prison Culture, but she's a leading prison and police abolitionist. She's the founder and director of Project NIA, and co-founder of Interrupting Criminalization. She's the author of the New York Times bestseller, We Do This Till We Free Us, and co-author with Andrea J. Ritchie of No More Police, which I am reading right now. I'm trying to read it slow so I get all of it. (laughs) And uh, she lives in New York City. She also um, has a children's book called See You Soon, um, which is, uh, she has has a lot of stuff. (laughs) Um, Thanks very much for giving me some time today. Sure, of course. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, all right. I'm going to dive in. And actually, I, I was curious. Um, I didn't know your name for a while. I only knew your Twitter name. Um, have you? Do you do anonymity? Do you divide some of your activism from your other life? I wasn't sure about that. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah, I, um, I basically came online... Uh, in terms of prison culture back in 2010. Um, I am, before that, I was not on any social media. I, um, basically a young person that I was working with for many years uh, who was in conflict with the law was the person who first brought to my attention that I should have a blog uh, because he was like, you have a lot of good things to say, Ms. Kaba, you should have a blog. And I was like, I don't even know how to make a blog. So he's the one who actually made Prison Culture blog for me um, mm-hmm. to start. And uh, he connected it to Twitter. And that's how I got onto Twitter, which is still my main and only uh, social media that I really use. Um, but I came up, um, I grew up in New York City. Um, I was born... Uh, in 1971, I came of age in the 1980s and 90s, and I um, grew up with touchstones and mentors who reminded us if you were organizing, it was organizers in the back and leaders up front. And I just kind of, that was the way that I always moved. I was always and still am much more comfortable in the background than I am um like upfront in any sort of way. And so when I started the blog, I didn't want it to be um, a blog that was my name. I, you know, I, I picked prison culture because it made sense. I, that's the work I was focused on is anti-criminalization. I was using the blog in part to like, as a journal of my work in some specific way, a way, a place where I could dump what I was reading, what I was thinking about in work-wise, stories that were coming up that I could share, um, things like that. And so, yeah, so I basically, again, came up in a space where it was normal not to be upfront and that was comfortable for me and I still feel more comfortable that way. Over the last few years, I've been more public in the sense that people have invited me to do things and so, I needed to use my name for those things, like a book. Um, but yeah, that's basically where where that all stems from. Well, anarchists definitely understand the love of anonymity. <laughs> um, and obviously, I'm going to talk about your most recent book. Um, but since we're kind, of, it's almost a segue to. I'd love for you to describe kind of your politics, how you describe yourself, and um, well, I guess start with that if you can. Yeah, I mean, I don't really, I, I, don't, I guess I don't describe my politics as any one thing. I, I mean, if I have to, pl- I don't like to plug myself into one ideological. I have, like, I'm, I, w- I would say I heard um, uh, somebody mention or quote uh, Harsha Walia, who said something like, I'm ideological ideologically poly it was was something that she used in talking about herself (laughs) and um and i you know i think that that's probably true for me i think i am more rooted in a kind of commu socialist tradition um but yeah i have a lot that i appreciate from different traditions on the left so um i you know i always 
thought certain things in socialism have had appeal, certain parts of communism have had appeal to me, um, certain parts of anarchism have had appeal to me, um, specifically focusing on the way how we socially organize ourselves and the importance and salience of relationships and mutual aid and things like that I've gotten from my anarchist colleagues and comrades. So, um, so yeah, so I would say that I'm, I'm definitely a left person, a leftist, and I, I, I'm also very much grew up in a tradition of Pan-Africanism. My father was a Pan-Africanist. Um, so yeah, I, I dabble all over. Um, I found a quote where you said um, to, to uh, abolitionism and anarchism are positive rather than negative projects. Right. Which, um, I thought was an interesting grouping, broad grouping of them together. Um, I do. Well, because I think for me, I've always understood anarchism to be a project of building and constructing um, a world within a world, almost. The, the, the idea that, yes, to tear down states and, though, to build social relations that allow people to be able to flourish and live. And so that's what I mean when I say that that is a uh, positive project, not a project that is mainly focused on the dismantling of things, but a project that is actually really, really centered on how do we build the world in which we want to live. And that kind of prefigurative politics that is part of anarchism is also deeply rooted in, in abolitionism um, and abolitionist thought. That the notion that we, um, again, build a world within the world uh, prefigure the world in which we want to live, uh, act as if, like all those ideas are very much rooted, um, I think, in those traditions. Um, and just really briefly, not that we don't we don't want to clash or or, or anything, <laughs> but um, can you, is there something about anarchism that doesn't work for you, or some big flaw or sticking point for you? I mean, in terms of anarchism, particularly, I, I think. I consistently find myself still trying to understand decentralization to the point of how we distribute resources um, in ways that would be equitable. I, I can't, I, I still, you know, I, I still struggle with a form. Uh, it doesn't have to be a state form, but a form that needs to exist that allows for a centralized way for people to be able to access what they need. Um, and I and my anarchist friends have great ideas and thoughts and suggestions around how that is possible to do without centralization. I am the one who have a block who has a block on like the how of it. Um, in a world where we do still have oppression and that, you know, I feel like these things will devolve always to the most privileged groups in society being able to find their way and everybody else basically being left to fend for themselves. So, um, so yeah, so I think, I think about those kinds of things and those, that would, that's something I'm still puzzling through and it's not something that couldn't be overcome, but it's something I have questions about. Um, that makes sense to me. Uh, <laughs> you move to, to your most recent book though. I saw that you already have one, um, coming <laughs> next year. I do. <laughs> ridiculous. Ridiculous. Because Very I'm not a writer. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, well, can you, I mean, uh, again, I don't, I don't want to like make up 30 second sound bites or anything, but do you have like an elevator pitch, they call it for, for ending the police? Mm -hmm. as <laughs> well, I mean, the book, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> well, the book is called No More Police, A Case for Abolition. It's um, a focus we are questioning police and policing as um, so-called, quote, public safety producers. We make the case that policing is mainly about protecting systems of wealth and power, um, which isn't shocking to anybody who knows anything about police and policing, um, that in this moment, in this iteration of police and policing, because police and policing has changed over time, it's not a static thing, um, that in this moment, police are, as um, Alex Goodwin has said the muscle of racial capitalism um, and that racial capitalism subsidizes basically white wealth accumulation 
and that police preserve economic gender and racial hierarchy. And so our point is that um, we can't be in a position where uh, we won't be able to do what we want to do. We won't bring in any kind of socialist, communist, anarchist futures um, with the cops in the way, that they have to be moved out of the way in order to bring those futures into being, and in our case, an abolitionist future into being. Um, and people always say, well, don't the cops, you know, we need the cops because of crime or whatever. And our point is that the cops sometimes respond to some quote unquote crimes, but they don't prevent them. And that even more um, that we contend that they kind of announce insecurity by their very presence and that they actually are a drain on what we could have in, in terms of the commons. So it's not like having the cops is not a neutral factor. And I think that's the point that I feel like a lot of people just gloss over, like, but aren't they a good because we need them because of crime? And I'm like, but what are the social costs of police and policing? Why is it that you assume that they just have one thing to offer, which is called crime, which is constructed anyway, and harm are not the same things. And so like, let's concentrate on addressing harms. And what are the best ways for us to do that? Is our cops the best way to do that? So that's basically our, our it's not, that's not 30 seconds, but that, give you, that gives you a general sense of what we're trying to do with the book. Um, I've seen you talk to, I know you work, I mean, you're an activist, so you've inter interacted with differing groups, but I haven't seen you moderate the message of total police abolition, uh, prison industrial complex abolition. Have you tried moderate or were you ever moderate in your career yeah. at this or even your personal life? Absolutely. I mean, not not even moderate. I would say I was a police and prison preservationist. I, how could I not be? I grew up. I mean, I mentioned I was born in seventy one. I grew up in New York City. Um, I uh, grew up in this country. <laughs> I so it is the default position to assume that prisons and policing are natural. Like that's you don't even question it. It's not a thing. It just exists. And so, you know, I always say, you know, abolitionists are not born, they are made. And that is true. You learn over time as you are exposed to what these systems actually, quote unquote, do, right? Like the outcomes of the systems and what the systems actually do. And then you also have to weigh like, this is what they purport to do, but they don't do that. What is going on? And that's really what happened to me was I grew up just like assuming, yeah, the cops are there. I, they were horrible to us. They harassed my brothers constantly in our community. Like they were horrible, you know, like there was a, we never called them for anything. Like they were, they, I was more fearful of them, them than I was like seeing them as officer friendly ever. So like, I did not have a romantic view of cops growing up and I knew they were killing people because I saw it all the time. I knew they were certainly harassing people because we experienced that. So I did not have like a romantic view of that. I just had a naturalized view that they were just the landscape. They just existed. So for me growing up in that way as a preservationist, I um, it wasn't until later, like through life experience and things like not jiving. And because I'm a critical thinker, like I was actually always questioning from the time I was very young, like, why is that? What is that supposed to, like, I would be that, I was that kid and my parents still laugh about it. My mom does and that's my father passed away. But, you know, my mom is like, you were the most why kid. Like, just why do we have to do it this way? What? But surprisingly, I didn't ask, why does the system have to be set up this way until I was older? So yeah, so I have complete, that's just why I'm actually not, I never get upset when people ask me questions about like, well, what, what else? Like, what's going to happen? Like, whatever. And freak out about it. Cause I'm like, that was me. You know? <laughs> so I get it, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, when, when did that change for you? I mean, is, a, is, is there a moment? A, yeah. It's a good question. Cause I don't think I can pinpoint one moment. It was a, it just, it was an evolution of thought and experience because for me, I had all these experiences. I, my brother was uh, 
falsely accused of a issue, like of a of a thing that happened in the neighborhood in the community. They had the wrong young black man, wrong age. He was twelve. They thought the person that did the damage was 18 which he was like all these things occurred so i had that but i didn't have an analysis of it i had friends that kept getting arrested and going to rikers so in my community but then i had i went to a private school on the upper east side of, of new york and the kids like my my co my uh student uh, comrades over there, they were doing the exact same things as my neighborhood friends, and they were not arrested for drugs. Like we would go to parties, and they were they were very rich, all of them, and they just had like drugs galore at all the parties. Never raided by the cops, never arrested for same kinds of behaviors. They shoplifted all the time, never harassed. And I, but I didn't put two and two together until I was. Um, I had a couple of experiences. One was a former student of mine got caught up in the system and I saw firsthand what was going on then. And I was like, I was older. So I had a better understanding of like, this is just a mess. You know, this is not okay. And then all of a sudden people started around me, started being like, what, what? There's, this is bullshit. Like, you not, you know, like these things don't make sense. Why are these people constantly being harassed and these people are not? What is going on about that? Like, you need to think, you know? So I was pushed in some ways by the people that I was around as a younger person. Um, I noticed as a person who was a survivor of rape, who got raped, you know, se who was experienced sexual violence, I never even considered contacting the cops. I was like, oh, what? you know, Where's that coming from? Like all these kinds of things that um, became like just part of the the fabric of my understanding came together because of experiences and people and reading and learning and just being like, this ain't it. This is not it. And and being promised things that I knew weren't true. And I was just like, this isn't actually happening in the way that everybody keeps talking about. Then I started working in domestic violence work and I worked at a domestic violence organization and none, literally, none of the per people that I was working with who were, who needed tons of support wanted to call the cops. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm a anti-violence person, like a anti-violence activist and organizer and none of the, this was predominantly women who are in this shelter want to call the cops did you ask them why they didn't yeah ever? they were like they had so many responses they were like i my my husband or partner was already incarcerated before i'm not gonna have that happen they are my my sole economic provider i don't want them in that system because i know that system sucks they're the father of my child they're like they had a ton of reasons right but again did i know that like i didn't grow up in a DV situation in my home. So I did not have that similar like experience of like what would, but I had had the experience of being raped and being like, I'm not calling the cops. I knew why, because it was a family member. Like there was a lot of complications there, right? And I was like, oh, okay. Everybody keeps telling me that it's for these particular people, including me as a young person. That's why we have the cops, but nobody actually wants to use them. So what is the hell is going on here? So it's just a lot of that stuff really made a difference for me. As somebody who has been living and paying attention, well, no, first of all, I have been trying to pay attention to criminal justice <laughs> reform, broadly speaking, for many years. And to me, to me, the, the, the killing of Michael Brown in 2015, and then obviously the killing of George Floyd in 2020, to me, those are the big moments where, you know, I don't know how much good has happened or how much progress in some ways, but like the national media actually started covering police brutality more regularly. I don't know, like when you saw things change at all, especially for the better, or if, if, you, if you think they have on this in terms of attention, I guess. Attention. Um, well, I mean, after Mike Brown was killed, I guess it was August of 2014. I think that is, that was a, that so many things came together. And one of the biggest things was social media. Mm -hmm. Like, I think the big difference in terms of attention, at least, and spread of the ideas and the ability to have kind of like the, 
the helping of like uh, kind of kicking off more of a generalized sense that like something is wrong. I think that social media had a lot to do with that. And, and the way that particularly Twitter hit at that particular moment for that, because I, I grew up when one of my like politicizing moments was the killing of Michael Stewart in 1983 in New York, a young man who was, you know, older than me, but still young, um, who was accused of, he had been an artist, so he'd been tagging um, subway car, cars. And at that time he was tagging and the cops basically uh, interrupted him, ended up taking him, beating him to death and then throwing him at the hospital and he ended up dying over there. And it was one of the conflagrations that really like in New York in the eighties, Michael Stewart's um, murder by the cops really became this thing. And then a couple years later it was, or one year later it was Ellen and Eleanor bumpers getting killed and like just a, a whole series of things that were happening. But it was so, it was, even though it was, it, it went beyond New York city, it was much harder for things to move out of our cities because things were, much more localized. The press was more localized. You know, if you didn't get something in the Times or the Post or one of the national papers, it was hard for it to break through. In this case for Michael Brown, it really was like, you know, people on the ground in those cities were able to get their own video, their own stories, their own narration, their own. And that I think made a huge difference. So I don't know if it's, I don't know what the, you know, I don't, I think it just became much more, e it became easier to connect with what was going on. Also, I think a lot of organizers and activists had learned some lessons from the past. Um, and among those were that it was really important to have unmediated ways for people to be able to engage with what was going on. They, uh, you know, they did a really good job basically having networks where they were able to bring the story and keep the story in the news because now there were protests in Cincinnati and now there were also protests in New York in the streets and there were you know like people were able to pick it up and Atlanta was shut down and they people were able to do that in a totally different way now does that mean to me like we're in a place right now where um things are quote better than they ever were or whatever I don't know if I would say that I would just say that things are different now mm -hmm than they were. And that difference is still to be, uh, you know, we still have to figure out what that means for this current moment. Certainly the case that many more people can't close their eyes to the fact that this is happening. Um, but we're as human beings, we're really good at compartmentalizing and pretending to forget. So every day is like a new opportunity for you to like pretend to forget what you actually know. So you see that all the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in a way it's, it's self-preservation and survival. Because I think if you take it all in all the time, how do you live? How do you make your next move? What do you do? You know, it's very difficult. So I get it. I get why that is the case, but um, yeah. Um, well, in terms of the potential for optimism, I was definitely worried that we were heading for a backlash to criminal justice reform, mm -hmm. a backlash to something that we haven't done yet. You know, yeah. all the fear-mongering about uh, bail and yeah. things like that. Um, I don't know if the de the Democrats winning more, obviously Democrats are Democrats, but if, <laughs> if, if that's encouraging at all, I mean, does it, how much do you fear a backlash before we even get anywhere? Yes. There's, I, I'm of the belief that there's, we're not ever dealing with backlash. We're dealing with persistent front lash. Like okay. I, I do not subscribe to the view of like the, the progress narrative, which then allows you to like backtrack. You know, it, I just think we're in a perpetual state of struggle and that there's a perpetual front lash from the right and from other reactionary forces. So I don't, I, I, I did not under any circumstances think like I, we didn't defund anything, but I knew it is my belief and my contention. Other people will disagree. To me, defund was one of the, and is one of the best uh, encapsulations of a demand that's come out of the left in, I don't know, a couple of decades or more. Um, it is clear, everybody knows what it means. The difference is that people don't want to do it. 
this is not, that's not a reason for why you jettison a political demand. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people don't want to do a lot of shit. Like a lot of people don't want Medicare for all. You should still advocate for your position if that's your position, right? And I think defund has shaken up so much. And the way you know that is that it lives rent free in the heads of liberals and the right. And it just, they cannot, right? It, they cannot, everything is around that. We're usually in a position where we have to react constantly to their bullshit. The fact that they're constantly feeling like they have to put this at the center and they have shorthanded it tells me everything I need to know, which means like, um, at least on the abolitionist left, we should be leaning in. We should not be like recoiling and, you know, being afraid and, I don't believe in that. I think you push, you push and push and push and you keep pushing forward because I promise you that defund is not even what we're like. That is the floor of the demand, right? Like we want to abolish the system. We don't want to just defund it. Defund to me is the how we get to where we need to go. It's a step in the process of the direction you're going. It's not the whole end and because God knows like, you know, it, you could take away half of the power, right? And the resources from this institution and the institution will remain deadly. So like, that is not, that is not the goal. That's not the final goal. So that's why I'm like, we're actually, we were being pragmatic mm -hmm. by talking about invest divest. Like that was like our, the language we were giving to the liberals for their ability to think about policy in a different kind of way. That's not even the goal. So. I'm not worried, you know, I'm just like, we are gonna, so now that that's the case, I don't see this as a backlash. They, how long have they been funding the cops, both on the liberal side and on the right? That's what they do. They fund the reactionary forces. On the liberal side, it's because law and order, rule of law, that stuff matters deeply to them in an institutional way. And on the right, it's because they understand who those forces are there to serve. And they are, thrilled to be able to use those forces when it is in their interest to actually quash all the other people that they're trying to dominate. So like, that, so we have to be clear of our analysis and keep it moving. I feel really good about how far this uh, demand penetrated and continues to penetrate. And trust me that they will, the liberals will soon be packaging defund as the default uh, reform. I mean, it's, it, it, it will come. It may not be tomorrow or in a, it'll be like in five years. They'll be late as usual, but then they'll be begging for defund by that point, you know, because these the, the cops aren't going to stop. They're not changing. They're not changing one bit. They keep getting the resources they want. They are political actors. They're excellent organizers. They know how to be able to like secure the bag for themselves, you know, so and they're going to keep harming people and keep killing people that. This year has been the deadliest year in years, maybe even a couple of decades of cops killing people. They've killed more people this year than than on record of tracking people they've killed. So I, I, given that that's the reality, there's only a, it's only a matter of time for the next uprising because mm -hmm. they haven't changed their behavior and people aren't, they don't put up with just getting killed without eventually something kind of rising to the top and people being like, no, this is not acceptable, you know? I still, I mean, that, there's a lot of optimism in there and I like yeah. to hear that. Yes. I, I always fear the average, you know, probably white middle-class person. Yeah. And how supposedly they're easy to sway with fear. Yeah. Crime is a very basic fear, you yeah. know? Your family's in danger. Your maybe meager property is in danger. I mean... Yeah. 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 I think that's right. And I think that it makes sense to me that people would be scared. I don't want to be a victim of crime. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying crime. I'm going to, I don't want to be a victim of harm, right. period. <laughs> what, whether it's criminal or not, you know? So like, that's not the issue. Crime is not the measure of whether or not safety is incur uh, occurring. You know, like we have a lot of things that are criminalized that should not be because they aren't harmful to anybody else. And there are a bunch of things that are harmful that probably hurt, like that hurt so many more people exponentially that we don't consider crimes. So, you know, wage theft is not a crime. Like, you know, like, I mean, these are 
thousands and thousands and millions of people impacted by those kinds of harms. So I think that we need to think really deeply about that. But I also think that those kind of run of the mill white folks in the suburbs, whatever, they saw something in 2020, sorry, they saw, they saw something in 2020 that cannot be unseen even if they want to try to unsee it. And I think that says all it, because they'll be, they'll always be recall of that for the next time and the next time and the next time. So, yeah. Um, oh my gosh, there's so many things. To ask <laughs> uh, um, I guess to press at what your world of abolition looks like. I mean, I, I, I got a taste in the book and I would encourage people to read you know, uh, no more police or any other book that you happen to have written, but <laughs> just, you know, what would the, your, your abolitionist world look like and what is taking the place of police or yeah. in prison? Or is that, you know, too simple of a, of a no. analysis? No, it's not. Um, my, my regular answers to that is that no one thing takes the place of any other one thing. Right. Um, that's the whole point. Um, we believe at most of the time as abolitionists, since our focus is on um, ending all forms of violence um, of, at all levels. Um, and we know that the reason we are, you know, we focus on policing and prisons and surveillance is because they are inherently forms of concentrated forms of violence. And that's one of the reasons we don't want them as institutions. Um, and so, uh, you know, I really ask people to think about two things. The first is it doesn't matter what my vision is, my singular vision. It matters that we build a collective one um, and that we do that in a contested way, um, that we argue about what we want to see in the world and what we don't want to see and that we make that world together. So that's the first answer and first important answer. The second thing that people like to ask me about is like, but if not, you know, um, don't the cops keep us safe and you know and I'm my always my question back to people is how do you keep yourself safe now like what what do you do on a daily basis that keeps you safe how often do you interact with these systems that you're so afraid are going to be gone and you'll be left bereft as a result what what's real like on a day-to-day -day basis I want people to think about in the last two years when did you call the cops for anything the vast majority of us have not called them for a thing in our entire lives, okay? So that's just one thing I want people to constantly think about. And I'm like, when they say, well, what about this? And I'm like, well, okay, you're afraid of that. What other ways might we actually address the thing that you're so afraid of? Like I lived in a building for many years in Chicago. And one of the, uh, the things that we ended up doing was creating a, a building-wide um, uh, phone tree that allowed us to be able to alert each other when things were going on because we were closer to each other and possibly likely to be able to help each other more than the cops were going to be able to help us for random things that were going on in the area in the neighborhood and that there was power in numbers particularly if we could come together in our area and be like okay you know this person looks like they're about to like hit this person and we're sitting at the window calling out and just being like we see you we know what's going on interrupt you know interrupted that fight and that struggle gave people enough time to go downstairs and ask the person if they needed support and help and what support and help they needed now if that person said we need the cops i wouldn't then stop it and say i'm an abolitionist i'm not going to call the cops for you i would call the cops for that person <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, I am not one of those people who's like an evangelist for abolition. What I believe for me is that abolitionist politics and abolitionist organizing, abolitionist ideologies make the most sense for me about the world that I'm hoping to live in. I'm hoping to live in a world where I call on my neighbors first, where I call on non people who don't carry guns to come and deal with wellness checks where I can actually have a world where things that people need, they have, right? Like abolition, abolition is not people always like are, you know, just the cops just and I'm like, no, everything has to change to make those other systems obsolete. So when Angela Davis asked our prisons obsolete that book, tiny, tiny book, all it tells you in there is the conditions that make these things feel like things we need 
are what we have to address. And that means that like we have to address poverty. We have to address houselessness. We have to address environmental injustice. We've got to address having clean water. We've got to address people having good schools to go to. Like all those things, if you're working on them, you're working in the service of an abolitionist future. Because all those things are going to need to be in place to make these death-making systems obsolete for people. So that's a little bit about what I think people don't understand when abolitionists speak is they immediately go to what about the rapists and the serial killers? I know that's always the question. And we have a whole great little publication that we put out last year called What About the Rapists? And it's literally that question. What about them? Like, wait, rapists aren't currently locked up. They're, you know, in your community. They're your uncle. They're your sister-in-law. They're Like, they're here. They're among us already doing a lot of harm and damage. So yeah, what about them? What are we going to do about that, right? It's We've got to address rape culture. We've got to do a whole bunch of other things that are needed that don't get resolved or solved by these death-making institutions. So um, so yeah, so that's a little bit about kind of the the vision and the hope. And it's like, yeah, not it's not going to be one thing. It's not, you know, it's not going to be, that's part of what has gotten us in this trouble is that, Every single harm doesn't need the same response. Mm. Every single thing that occurs in the world doesn't have a one size fits all way of addressing it, which is why we're in the position we're in right now is that everybody's turning to the death making institutions as the response, the default Mm. response. And it's not working because of course it's not working because a lot of shit doesn't need to actually be in those spaces. It needs other responses. We've been kind of, all, it's been crowded out. All those other responses have been crowded out by those death-making institutions. For me, the goal is to crowd out the death-making institutions with our responses. So, and it's a long-term project I won't be here to see the end of. So I'm not, I'm not pressed. I just want us to be working towards the obsolescence of these institutions over time. And let's do the best we can along the way to make that happen. You are not going to wake up tomorrow and have no cops. It's just not feasible. They are a huge jobs program. They are a huge political actor. They are like, we just, you're not going to, unless there's some magic that comes down and people come down and just sprinkle fairy dust over the whole thing and they disappear, that's not going to happen. So you're going to be in struggle to get rid of them. So that just get on the fucking struggle bus and let's make that happen, you know? Um, that's, wow, that's so much. <laughs> I was going to ask you, um, we're, we've kind of hit cops a little more about prison and jail, yeah. not just what do we do with Jeffrey Dahmer, but I yeah. mean, um, what what does like justice look like to you? Restorative or transformative? Which one yeah. makes sense to you? This is a really hard question on multiple levels because it's so subjective, mm-hmm. right? It's part of why we're in the mo- we're in the pro- like it's why we have the issues we have, which is that justice does we use it as a short term, but it just doesn't mean the same thing to each of us. For some people, justice equals vengeance. For Mm. some people, justice equals the thing never having happened in the first place. For some people, like there's just a range of feelings and then justice married to people's feelings. Oh my God, right? It's so, Mm -hmm. so huge. Um, But to me, justice is situational, it's relational, and it's constantly uh, negotiated. And what I mean by that is for some people who cause me harm, I want them to apologize to me. And that feels like enough. I would love to have like an accounting that you know that you did this and it really made a difference in my life and it was harmful and I don't want you. For other people, what I want them to do is I don't give a fuck about your amount. I don't even care. I don't want to know, okay? I don't want to talk to you. I don't want you in my life, but I want you never to do this to somebody else. That would be justice for me. In another case, I might want restitution. Maybe you ruined something and what I really want is for you to pay me back for all the whatever things that you did. And, you know, and if you can't do it right now that you spend, make a plan for how you're going to do it over time. For other people, it might be that they have to leave their job, that they had all this power to be able to implement lots of harm and lots of people. They have to step down from that 
and give up their power. Like that is justice, you know? For other people, it might be that they can't live in this area anymore and they gotta find a new area to live in because they just can't coexist with the people they harmed in these deep ways, right? Like justice, again, because I mentioned it has to be situational, it is relational and it is negotiated. It means different things to different people, which is why having the state impose, quote, their sense of justice on makes no sense when you go to court and it's not even your name. It's the state against the person who caused you harm. You've been cut out of it all the way. You're not even real. They could maybe make you have like some sort of victim statement at the end. But what? You know, you're not in it. It's the state taking the responsibility to, quote, meet out justice on behalf of us as individuals. A, a state that is racist, <laughs> that is misogynistic, that is transphobic, that is, you know, all these things. And that's like the arbiter of justice. It ju Does that make sense to you? Like, if you think about that deeply, does that make any sense to you? Is that who you want represent? Think of the most racist person you could ever imagine that it may be there in your family. And then put them in the position of meeting out, quote, justice for shit that went on down for you. And think of how ridiculous that sounds. That's the state. <laughs> or even, I mean, start like that's absolutely that. Also, just I've always thought just starting with the idea that the state is pretending that it's the victim yes because the law was violated and therefore the state has been victimized because their rule has been violated no yes. matter if they're a yes. real victim or not yes so that i hope that answers the question because i to me that's what it is it's gonna have to be situational it's gonna have to be relational it's gonna have to be negotiated over time that's justice and sometimes it feels elusive um, because it's very hard to make anybody do anything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can coerce people into doing a whole bunch of stuff. The whole system currently is set up that way. And we see how little accountability people actually take for the harms they cause underneath that system. So clearly that's also, you know, people are like punishment. I'm like, yeah, punishment feels good. Punishment is passive. And it's the thing we can do because, you know, we don't have to do much to make that happen. Accountability is a whole different thing. Right. And so, yeah. I was um, curious about, I'm, I'm thinking of sort of leftist patches and buttons type things that say things like kill your rapist or yeah. things that are very radical sounding yeah. and are very violent, very permanent solutions to obviously a re very real wrong. Yeah. I don't know what, how you feel about that sort of language and basically, you know, if you're a pacifist or not, if you're completely nonviolent, even in these you know a true victim of rape yeah you know, you know it and you kill them i mean what you know just how do you feel about that sort of you know justice yeah. to some people well that's a form of community accountability isn't it right it's it's community accountability it's just violent community accountability right like you are what we talk about when we talk about community accountability period is that people use whatever means they have at their disposal to stop the violence that they are experiencing at the time they're experiencing it doesn't mean that it stops it forever doesn't mean that it doesn't lead to retaliation like all those things still happen but at least the, there was a community accountable response that occurred so i i uh wanted to kill my rapists and probably some days if I wake up on a certain date, probably also still want to kill that person. I don't act on it, but I understand the feeling of wanting to do so and the anger that that you know, comes out of it. For me, um, there are a couple of things. The first is that I am an abolitionist who is rooted in transformative justice as the kind of pathway towards how I see abolition playing itself out, right? Not all abolitionists, though, are rooted in transformative justice. There are plenty of abolitionists who believe in the righteous use of violence, both as a preventative measure, but also as a retaliatory measure. For me, I don't see how, I don't know how we end violence by using violence. I don't see it. I understand self-defense. So that, so it's, these aren't hard things for me to reconcile. I understand that if you're at a point where you are trying to do something and somebody's trying to harm you and they may kill you, you have a right to defend yourself and defend your life. I always believe in that. And really that's violence, isn't it? It is, but it's violence in the service of preservation of your own life. You, you have the right, it's like a bodily autonomy respect situation. 
this is part of my long-term work with criminalized survivors of violence, many of whom kill their partners and are in prison for life. You know, we have tried to mount several campaigns and some of them have been successful getting them released from the criminal punishment systems, you know, uh, clutches. So I'm not confused about violence. I understand why violence is sometimes the answer for people in the, the having very little other option but to use it. So I'm not that. So in that way, of course, I'm not a pacifist. I can't be a pacifist in a world where violence is rampant and people need to be able to defend their lives. Um, so that's one thing. But I, I at core do not believe that we can end violence by using violence to end violence. I just don't. I don't think, I think there will be a constant ripple. We're constantly going to be in the cycle of retaliatory violence. And I don't want that world. I, I want a different kind of relationality. I want a different kind of world. So um, so yeah, so those are some things that I think, but I, you know, lots of my friends are killed their, you know, killed their, my, one of my best friends, Shira Hassan always says that the difference between the both of us is that she still believes in kill your rapist, but she's been tempered by me over time to realize that she, I'm not going to have a defense campaign to release her from the clutches of the criminal punishment system. Should she go ahead and do that? Right? Like, so we have to think about the consequences of our actions and a lot of people have killed their rapists and they are now under the jail, you know, under the prison. So we, yeah. it's all, it's all there. It's all, it's all there to be thought about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I have total understanding for that feeling. And I also know that it's sometimes necessary in the moment to use violence, to stop something and interrupt it. It just hasn't transformed the conditions or done anything to, you know, to uh, stop it from happening again. When it, okay, so we've been talking about, and I think I kind of agree more or less where it's like, I'm not uh, almost pacifism, direct self-defense, but like, yeah. I like to flirt with pacifism. Yeah. Um, but if you're talking about sort of the minimal amount of force required, no, I don't think I have a good, I don't think I have a good segue for this. So I'm just gonna, <laughs> okay. I'm just gonna ask my question. Thinking again of prisons, okay, and I'm thinking of a very specific situation. Like, um, I don't know if you, uh, Andrew's, what the hell is his name? Breivik, that guy who killed 75 people in Norway about uh -huh. a decade ago. Yeah. Um, what is wrong with the way that he is being held, which is a much bigger area than in U.S. prison? He definitely has more stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and like. I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't mind that he has an Xbox and a television and I think two rooms sort of much bigger than your average prison in, in the United States. Yeah. What is wrong with someone who has committed such an incredible amount of violence being held in a fairly humanitarian situation like that? I mean, uh huh. Uh -huh. well, um, the fact that you can name this person suggests the answer, which is that it is incredibly rare for anybody to kill 75 people. Right. And so we didn't build prisons for that guy. Right. Like the people who are locked up in prison are not him. Like that by, by miles, right? Mm -hmm. So the system doesn't, it's not there to address the 75 person kill. So that's the first thing I like to tell people. It's part of the same thing about like, what about the serial killers? I'm like, yeah, what about them? You know, like, you know, all their names. Um, that most of them have ended up in prison and or killed while they were in prison or executed. Like, what are you asking me about, really? You know, like, you're not asking me about those people. You are asking me about we, why do we, what we absolutely need. It's already like the idea is already there that there has to be a place where we send people who are beyond the pale. Right. right? And so my thing is, okay, why does it have to be prison then? Like, if you, if you, like, if I take it, if I take your thing, you know, and I take you at your, like, I take you at like being um, genuine and asking the question, like, okay, but you're sending this person to something that is kind of like prison light, I guess, right. is what they're right. doing here. And my thing is, the U.S. doesn't know how to do prison light because the U.S. culture isn't rooted in that. And because That's prisons true. in the U.S. don't exist for guys like that. It's the same question that gets asked constantly about Trump. 45, I always call him not his name. They'll say like, you know, but is like he's caused so much harm. Doesn't he need to be pr prosecuted? And, and I'll say to them, prisons weren't created for people like 45, 
That's why you're spending all your time here. Like, it's going to, if they end up incarcerating him, it would be the biggest outlier exception in the history of prisons. In our, like, that is not, that's not a good reason for you to tell me that that's why we ought to keep prisons. Sure. Right? Like, that is not actually the justification for the need for prison, that we need it to be able to incarcerate people like 45 or the serial killer that killed 75 people or the mass murderer. Like, those are not the reasons. You don't build a system based on the most extreme case and then tell me that that's why the system exists. It's not, it doesn't make sense to me. So as I mentioned to you before, if all the other things that I want in my abolitionist future come into being, I promise you we're going to have less of these serial killers mm -hmm. because we will have had a lot of other things shift and change so that that will be still even less as it is so rare now, it would be even less rare, which would give us even less of a reason to have the fucking prisons we have today. So we're gonna have to figure out some other way and promise you that when I say we will figure it out by working to get there is praxis, not evasion, right? Like we are gonna figure it out by working to get there and we've got a long way to go in figuring out to make that happen. It's not me saying I don't have an answer for that. It's me saying we're gonna make answers for that over time with each other. But this thing, the thing that's here, that's not it. The prisons that exist, that's not it. The cops that exist, that's not it. The surveillance systems we have, those are not it. That's my, that is my case to people, right? It's like, you want something to deal with, quote, the most extreme cases. And I'm saying that is not how you build a system. You don't build a system focused on the most extreme cases because the vast majority of us are not serial killers and vast majority of us aren't raping people. Okay, that's just a fact. If that were, if that were not true, we wouldn't have a society. Okay? <laughs> we would not. And I know, like, again, this is not me minimizing harms. Of course not. The reason I got into doing, the reason I started, I'm an activist because I care about violence and harm. That's what got me into the work. So I'm constantly focused on people. I'm constantly working directly with people who are harmed. I do that in my life. So don't, you know, like, I don't need people to, like, lecture me about, they always try to lecture abolitionists that we don't care about harm. No, we don't care about crime. <laughs> we care about harm a lot. You know what I mean? We don't care yeah. about the social constructions that you motherfucking people put on saying this is the worst and this is the... No. A lot of harm happens. We want none of it. Mm -hmm. How about that? <laughs> How about well, that? You know? <laughs> yeah, you're making uh, some good arguments. And there's, there's <laughs> anarchist vibes. Like, there's an anarchist spirit in them, even if that's not exactly your bag. <laughs> quite like... Um, one of one one of the resources instead of police, people talk about a lot is, is better mental health care. I don't know if you can uh, touch on that even a little bit because to me that's incredibly important and better than police. But it's also the mental health field involves coercion as yeah. well. Yeah, especially for people who are having a like a particularly hard time. I mean, yeah. if you're I don't know if you have thoughts on that at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have a lot of thoughts on that. We have a whole thing at Interrupting Criminalization. You mentioned is one of the organizations I co-founded mm -hmm. and I run now um, with Andrea Ritchie and others. Um, and uh, we have a whole mental health practice space for this reason. We meet, um, I know, I'm not part of this one. Andrea holds that down with Shira. Um, but they meet on a monthly basis. And it's exactly to have these conversations, which is that we are not trying to replace carceral institutions with new carceral institutions that basically are about coercing people and being non-voluntary and saying like you, so that's just another form of jailing and another form of enclosure and captivity. No, this is not the point. The point is not to end police with and then bring in soft policing. Like this is not the point people, can we please get out of that? Like, I just want us to, Think about what's going to need to be transformed in the conditions of our society in general so we are healthier and more well. And to me, telling somebody who is uh, having a, a mental issue that they have to go into this space and that they then have to stay there is jail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is not, we are not, just because we call it something different, 
and, she, and add some new patina to it and say that, oh, now you can actually go out twice a day instead of not at all, that that is somehow like a big movement forward. No. So we do a lot of work in the book to talk about soft policing, to talk about the need for not replicating carceral systems with new carceral systems, including mental health stuff. And we are using mental health practice space to bring together people who are starting these new mental health responses to policing um, instead of policing. They're coming together as a cohort of people from around the country to discuss how not to replicate these systems of coercion. So we're all aware of what's going on. It's gonna be hard to see if we can actually implement and execute the vision in a non-carceral way, because it's such a draw. It's such a thing It's like, well, well, what if this person doesn't do what I say? What if like, you know, like mm -hmm. I understand it, but we have to just, we just have to keep trying and experimenting, seeing how it goes. I guess when I hear about this stuff, I, I, I'm doing a lot of agreeing, yeah. but I'm also an introvert and I don't yes. have a very strong sense of community um, uh, that my most directly across the street neighbors have had a blue line flag up for the entire time I've lived here. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I think more people live in communities, you know, and I know that that's a thing, but when it's not and when you're talking about you know, if your neighbor's having a problem, you yeah. and other people go and you try to deal with it. It almost, it's daunting to me because yeah. of that type of, of thing, the need for community and, and talking and engaging yeah. a lot. Yes, you are absolutely right, Lucy. It is hard as hell. <laughs> and introverts, I'm also, believe it or not, an introvert. So I understand, like, I actually don't like people. I say this to people all the time. I don't actually like people. I love humanity, mm -hmm. but I don't like people individually because they're annoying. I like small people. <laughs> I like children. You know, like uh, this is why I, I love writing children's books. I mm -hmm. enjoy small people. I don't like adults. So I feel mm -hmm. like, you know, all those things are real. And yet, and yet, and yet we live in a society even when people don't want that to be true. And we are going to have to figure out ways. Like I have abolitionist friends who feel a lot of anger often when they're just like, I don't want to rely on my neighbors. I hate my friggin' neighbors. Like uh, those are real feelings. And we're not going to transform our societies and worlds if we don't know our neighbors. We're going to have to. And <laughs> you know, climate disaster. Like I think if anything, if COVID hasn't shown us the absolute necessity for us to be in community with other people, even when we are not wanting to, okay? It is that, it is like being isolated. It's not a, we are as human beings, we're just inherently interdependent. Mm -hmm. Everything we do relies on somebody else, whether they're visible to us or not. And we're just going to have to make it work for ourselves we're going to have to do more of it and as again as disasters increase and climate disasters increase if you're stuck in your house by yourself and no one around you knows your home that just increases the chances that you're not gonna make it out mm -hmm. you know and so you're gonna need to like at least have some sort of way of being like hey y'all like you know should shit go down check on me i'm by myself here you know, if you're an older, you have an older, I have my older neighbors upstairs who I go and check on. Mm -hmm. They have their kids live like all everywhere else and they don't live in the city. They, you know, and the, these are people who are, I just go up there and I'm just like, hey, y'all, how y'all doing? Did you get your, did you order your, your, you know, your uh, week, slot, your week of uh, supermarket supplies? Like I'm going to the store. Can I, you know, bring you just to, again, does it mean like I'm being nosy? No, they appreciate it. Did they think it was weird maybe at first? Maybe, but they totally appreciate it. And trust me that during COVID that shit came in handy because they needed help and people were not available to them easily to do that, you know? And it just matters because next time, you know, they do such nice things for me as a result, just in general, you know, like when my, they notice that my packages are totally packed or, or, you know, whatever. And I didn't even tell them that I'm out of town. They will take the packages and hold it for me. And then contact me and see like, hey, have you been gone for a while? Because your packages have totally piled up. I'm like, oh, my God, thank you. Yes, I'm gone. I'll be back next week. You know, like, please hold on to them. Like, just mm -hmm. things like that that don't seem like they're big things are huge things 
There are huge things in a culture that makes us feel like we should not be in, we shouldn't tell anybody our business. We shouldn't mm-hmm. ask for help. What like that is not the world I want to live in. Okay. I want the world where people check on me from time to time if they haven't seen me for two weeks. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you might be right about that. I mean, you need to do it. You need to figure out because I don't want you in a place where you're like all alone and you know you can't. You're isolated and you can't get what you need when things are going not great for you because that will happen, you know. And that's not a thing. It's an admonition. It's not like a oh because we're doing that. No, it's like actually your life actually does improve when you know that you're cared for by other people, even if they're not with you on a regular basis. You know. Um. Oh my gosh, I could ask you stuff all day. I know. I'm sorry. I'm about to get going soon. <laughs> I have one more thing for you. And um, at non Serbian, we like to ask this question, and sometimes I forget. But how would I get a cappuccino in your political utopia? Is the question. <laughs> how would you get a cappuccino? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Well, I don't drink coffee, so this is already a. a- how would I get it then, I guess? <laughs> question that stops that stumps me so you wouldn't be able to get it from me um but we will have spaces in the community that are like community kiosk spaces where um right now i'm actually partnering with a free space in brooklyn called somewhere good and um i have a collection of a uh, rotating monthly collection of zines that are there um that i curate plus a whole sampling of tea and people can just stop by there if they uh subscribe to the app they get to come to this space too the in real life space and they can check out zines and have tea so like- you would be able to do that in my you know, space that's not even utopian. It's just prefiguration. <laughs> it currently exists right now. So you'd be able to get that from there. Your right, cappuccino well. and zines. <laughs> All right, you add that coffee and maybe I'll stop by. Okay, I mean, I'm going to have to bring that up to the at the next meeting. So yes. <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to let you go now. Thank you. Um, do you want to plug yourself before we go where people should find you? Well, people can right now only find me basically on Twitter at Prison Culture, but I have a, a locked account. So I, I, I hardly like sometimes I open up and allow people to come in for a short time because friends of mine yell at me about the fact that they can't get into the account. And that's the only time I open for a few minutes. But um, but I'm on Twitter. Um, people can also follow Project Nia and Interrupting Criminalization at our websites. Um, and that's a way to be able to follow up on the work that we're constantly and currently doing. And then the last thing is, yes, I have a book coming out with my friend Kelly Hayes next May called Let This Radicalize You. And it's about organizing. um, And it's a book that we both wish we had when we were new and and, um, young organizers. So we wrote something that we hope will help new and young organizers. So. Yeah. Sounds like I might need that book. <laughs> I mean, you know, I said to a friend of mine, I was like, this is a book, you know, they're like, I'm pre-ordering. I was like, you've been organizing for like, as long as I have, like, that's like 35, 40 years. So I'm like, what are you getting? And they were like, I, you always need new inspiration. And I thought, wow, that's true, actually. So there you go. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining me today. Um, if we can ever catch you again, we'd, we'd love to have you back. But if not, I'm glad we made this happen. Absolutely. Hopefully, again, after next year, when I'm no longer in school full time and also working more than full time, I'll have more more spaciousness. So yeah, right. invite me again. I will. All have right. A good day. Take care. Bye bye. You're listening to the Non Serbian Podcast enjoy this episode why not subscribe over on our youtube channel or your favorite podcast platform you can also follow us across social media on twitter facebook instagram and mastodon if you're extra interested in seeing this project continue consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com but if you can't contribute financially we still like you a whole lot and you can help us out just by liking and sharing this episode or any other one that catches your fancy as always, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project alive. Thanks so much.